Thank you for staying with us. I'm Melissa Idris. With me, Professor Jayati Ghosh from Nehru University in India. We were talking a little bit about the Indian economy and the inequality there. Um, I want to get a sense from you. Are you optimistic about the Indian economy? And I have to say that, um, you know, this is all in the backdrop of what's happening globally in the in the global economy. Also in the backdrop of how Modi's policies twin with the politics of Hindu nationalism. So given all that and everything that we've discussed just before the break, are you optimistic about the future of the Indian economy? So I would say I am long run optimistic because I think there's so much potential and there's, I mean, India has so many capabilities sure. eventually. Short run, I'm pessimistic. I'm very pessimistic, okay. short run. What makes you pessimistic? So here's the thing. We had this major boom in the economy from about 2002 till about, you know, actually 2012. So a decade of major boom. Mm -hmm. But it was a boom that didn't generate employment and was massively increasing inequality. So even in the big boom period, employment grew by less than 2% per annum. When our labor force is growing and we have a younger and younger labor force. Okay and with low women's participation and everything, as I mentioned. Since then, in fact, and of course inequality in both wealth and income increased hugely over this period. Since then, we've had two major things which have completely destabilized the economy. And already in that period of boom, we didn't get enough mass consumption demand growing because wages, employment were not growing enough, mm -hmm. right? But then in 2016, November, we got demonetization, which was, uh, a, an amazing move to basically declare 86% of the value of currency in circu circulation no good mm. overnight. Yes. You can't use it. Now, this was like a death blow to the informal economy because they were all cash driven. And new money didn't come back into the system for about eight months. So there was just no money. People could not buy anything. And as a result, all kinds of informal sector collapsed. People lost their jobs. They lost livelihood. Traders didn't know what to do. I mean, it was a real mess. Okay, and this mess lasted for a while. Okay, and then when they were just about struggling, the government decided to introduce the, a goods and services tax, mm. which was very badly introduced. It was a very complicated scheme. It was designed badly and it was implemented even worse, in a sense like the demonetization. <laughs> and that did another blow to the informal sector. So 85% of the workforce is in informal activities. They are now, some of them are getting wages half of what they were getting before 2016. Wow. And so obviously they have no demand. Now this went on for a while and the government kept pretending that it's not there and kept providing GDP figures which now everyone pretty much realizes are cooked. Mm. And now all this lack of demand has finally hit the formal sector. So now people have stopped buying everything. Uh, automobiles, uh, the sales have been falling for four months, all kinds of vehicles, even two wheelers, uh, you know, uh, biscuits people are not buying. B biscuit, uh, all kinds of uh, things are simply no longer being purchased uh, at every level. Uh, to the point where, apparently I didn't know this before, the best indicator of a recession is the sale of male underwear. Male underwear. Uh, globally, I'm told. <laughs> why, this is the why best. Is that now, the best I don't know why, <laughs> but that's a, an indicator of recession. And in India, male underwear sales have collapsed. When men stop buying underwear, we know like, we're in trouble. Yes. <laughs> and so here we are now in a deep economic recession. Slowdown. Oh, well, slowdown. Mm -hmm. Technically, a recession is when GDP falls for two, for quarters. two quarters. We don't even know what's happening with GDP because the numbers are, really don't make sense. Yeah. But we know employment has fallen. We have lost 15 million employment in the last seven years. We know that wages are falling. We know that demand is coming down. We know that factories are unable to sell output. Many of them are laying off workers. So it's a recession by every other indicator. Well, what is the sentiment on the ground? When you talk to people, is there a sense of economic anxiety that deep. is translating to yes. everyday life? Deep, deep economic anxiety. And that's another reason why then you cut spending. Because you don't know whether you'll have your job, even if you have an income. So you cut spending. Mm. There are families that have gone back to two meals a day. There are children who are no longer getting milk with their morning meal. And all kinds of ways in which families are cutting back. It's not just the male underwear. Right. They are cutting back in all kinds of ways. Okay. And obviously that then affects the consumer sentiment, affects investor sentiment, and then nobody wants to invest because you're not selling the stuff you've produced already. Sure. 
So you said that this is, you know, you're, you're pessimistic in the short run. So what, what do you think is next then? Uh, where is the, what is the next stage of this economic So here's the thing. Slowdown? I would be less pessimistic if I felt that the government was going to do the things that are required. Okay. What, what's required, Professor? Well, clearly this is a problem of a demand collapse. So provide demand. We have a rural employment guarantee. Spend much more money on that. Provide many more rural jobs. All of these workers will go out and spend all that money, mm -hmm. and that will create lots of positive multiplier effects. We underprovide health, education, nutrition, sanitation. Spend lots more money on that. Again, that's very employment intensive. It will create lots of jobs. If the government simply filled the vacancies in all of these sectors, that would create 7 million jobs overnight. If they just filled the vacancies, 7 million jobs, all these workers would actually have incomes, they would go out and spend. You would get sentiment improving. Mm. So in the immediate short run, it's very clear what needs to be done. The government has to go out there and spend because nobody else is spending. Right. So, so is there political will to do that? I mean, you know, in the idea of fiscal spending in this, uh, fiscal policy in this direction, is there political will for that? Absolutely not. Uh, th there is complete denial, first of all, that there's a problem. And then even if you're willing to do something, all you're willing to do is what are called supply side measures. Mm. So the government says, okay, we'll you know, make the banks r lend out more credit. No one's taking the credit because they don't want to invest. Okay? Or the government says, we'll give the companies a more tax cut. They've just given a big tax cut to corporations. Again, that's not going to revive investment. Mm. So the government is refusing to accept the problem for what it is. That's the reason I'm so short-run pessimistic, because this can just get worse and worse. Okay. What could be a short-run cyclical slump could just descend into a stagnation. Well, you know, we've often talked about India as a financial economic superpower, but I'm, I'm trying to get the sense from you whether that position, that prestige, seems to be in jeopardy at the moment. So here's the thing. I think India has huge potential, as I said, and it is already. We have so many people. We are such a large economy. So you can't wish us away, right? <laughs> We're not going to disappear to from the scene. Yes. But I do believe that even the past trajectory is under serious threat. Mm. And this is something which, in fact, even now, more and more domestic and foreign investors are realizing. Everybody's waiting to see, OK, are they going to do something to revive the economy? Okay, well. The world is watching. The world there. is watching and it's really time that the government got its act together and did what is so self-evidently the thing to do. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but I've had such a wonderful time talking to you. And I've thank enjoyed you. it too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for Astro Awani. Thank you for watching.